Ah, uh, yes. Vintage, 1990s, of course. Italian, so not too bitter, not too sweet. Definitely in that sweet spot. Very fine year. Definitely has to do with everything still being on the vine. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A1 main battle tank. The model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, as I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model that you see here is built predominantly out of the box, however I went ahead and swapped out some of the kit original parts with several components from an aftermarket source. We'll be going over these additions and modifications, as well as giving this model a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this is another vehicle that hardly needs any introduction, the one, the only, the ubiquitous M60A1 main battle tank. This tank over here was the mainstay of the US armored car from the mid 1960s all the way up until the mid 1980s until it was eventually surpassed by the M1 Abrams. And even after the vehicle was supplanted by the Abrams, it still continued to see service with both the US Army and US Marine Corps up until the 1990s time frame. This vehicle here was built upon lessons learned from the earlier M48 family of vehicles. Many of the design cues that were on the M48 made their way onto the M60, as well as some other aspects of the vehicle were improved, making the vehicle superior to the legacy vehicle that it did replace. Some of the things that carried over was primarily with the construction. The M48 was the first American vehicle to utilize an all-cast elliptical bathtub type hull, and this type of design offered some very good ballistic protection, and this was carried over into the M60 vehicle. The front of the hull though was redesigned where on the M48 it was a blunt or had a frog nose to it while on the M60 they went with more of a blade or a pike type nose in comparison. Suspension wise the vehicles utilized many of the exact same components such as the track, the sprocket, as well as also the return rollers. Even the swing arms I believe were also interchangeable between the two. The major difference though between the 60 and the M48 was with the composition of the row wheels. The row wheels design on the M48 were utilizing steel stampings, however on the M60 or I should say the original versions of the M60 they were going to utilize aluminum castings. The two wheels, however, were the exact same dimensions and are actually interchangeable. And this is something that you would be seeing on lots of M60 and M60A1s when they entered service. Would not be uncommon for eventually some of them to be utilizing the wheels from the M48 if they had some on hand. But that's a topic for another day. The M60 was also diesel powered and was diesel powered from the get-go. In comparison, the M48 was originally gasoline powered and then eventually received its diesel modification in the A3 platform, but for the M60, it was from the ground up utilizing the diesel V12. For the crew layout, this basically stayed the same as, you know, if it isn't broke, don't fix it, but the one difference between the two vehicles is with the turret, namely the armament. The M48 utilized a 90 millimeter main armament, while on the M60, it was designed from the ground up to utilize the 105. The 90 millimeter utilized on the M48 was going to become inadequate with dealing with the newer designed Soviet tanks that were coming onto the scene. So on the M60, it was utilizing the British L7-105. The 105 is an excellent tank armament and was utilized, basically it was NATO standard and was utilized on all the other tanks found in the NATO inventory, such as the Centurion as well as also the Leopard. One design cue that carried over from the M48 series was with the concept of the mini turret cupola for the commander. Although on the M48 it utilized the Browning M2HB, for the M60 they went with the M85 50 cal, which was arguably a mistake, as was also the secondary armament not being any longer a 1919 derivative. Instead, now it was the M73, and both of those, shall we say, had less than stellar reputations. 
A large number of these vehicles were manufactured and, like I stated before, comprised the backbone of the U.S. Armored Corps. The U.S. military utilized them for several decades, and the vehicles were also widely distributed to other allied countries. Many of these countries are still utilizing these vehicles to this very day. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage M60A1 patent kit from Eshi. This particular kit here was one that I always wanted to add to my collection and do a model showcase video on, so it feels really good to finally be able to scratch that itch. Also, this is not technically the first time I've done a video on an M60A1 kit from Eshi. In fact, one of the very first 135th scale model showcase videos that I've ever done on this channel was an Eshi pattern of M60 model. However, that one was built for commission and was not for my own personal collection. And in that video, I go ahead and change several key aspects on the model, making it to the commissioner's specs. For this one here, I'm actually going to be more or less confined to what the out of the box kit gives me. And as for the kit itself, well again, it's from the Italian company Eshi. And if anyone is a fan of this channel, you'll know that I've done a handful of their kits already in the past. The Eshi M60 kit in general is actually one of their better kits, and this was a model that was always floating around in my youth. This was a very commonly available kit, and was one of those things that you would always see in the 90s, either in mail order catalogs, or you would see them from time to time when you enter your local hobby shop. Eshi themselves, again, is a, an Italian-based plastic model company. They are no longer in operation. They were founded, I want to say, in the mid-1970s, and they produced kits all the way up through the 80s and went defunct in the earlier mid-1990s. However, during that time period, they actually produced quite a, an extensive range of plastic model kits from airplanes to tanks. Not really going to go too much into airplanes. Max's Models has a fantastic history on the company itself, and that's... A, you know, a rabbit hole to go into all in itself. However, when it comes to their tank models, they did produce quite an extensive range from 172nd to 135. Their 135th scale tanks and military models in general were primarily models of a modern vintage. What I mean by that is you're not gonna see anything in World War II. They made vehicles such as the LAV-25 family of vehicle, and they also did the M60. Their M60 kit is actually a very nicely engineered kit specifically for the age. And if we can rewind our clocks back to that time period, at that time, if you were looking for an M60, you only really had two options or really more or less one of one option. You had the vintage kits from Tamiya, which by the 1990s time frame, the tooling dated back to the, to the 1970s, the M60A1 the original version wasn't even in production anymore, and that was kind of becoming a collector's item. And you had the M60A3, which was based on their 1974 tooling, but again, polished up. You also had the version from Academy, which again is relying on the older kits from Tamiya, and Academy themselves took that tooling, polished it up, and enhancing and making it to the format that we know today. But if you were looking for something else outside of the Tamiya environment, the Eshi kit here was your only option, and luckily the kit was actually very, very nicely engineered in comparison. Eshi themselves would produce this kit in a multitude of different flavors. This one here is the original release with the A1 configuration. They also went ahead and made a A3 version, and on top of that, they also went ahead and made a version for the Israeli pattern, where we have one version known as the Blazer, where it's just basically a standard American M60, but with just some extra Israeli equipment on it. All of these units were in production for a period of time and were widely available in the United States. Eventually, when Eshi went under, Italeri went ahead and purchased the rights and the molds for all of the mentioned kits, and Italeri have been periodically re-releasing them in one skies or another ever since then. Recently, Italeri re-released the M60A3 kit, which is the exact same tooling as this one here, but just with some different decals. Now, this is something that I have seen on forums when they were comparing the old school Eshi kits to the modern Italeri re-releases, is that apparently the older ones from Eshi do have crisper tooling on them, and the molds were obviously fresher when they were being produced by Eshi. By the time Italeri got the tooling and would 
re-released the models. The details on them were beginning to get a little bit on the softer side. However, this is something that I personally haven't seen in person because I don't have, you know, one for one to compare them with. But this is something that I did want to mention and it is one of those urban legends and urban myths that are out there, it, you know, portraying to these kids specifically. However, back to this one here, this is the original version. This was the one that I actually sought out and tracked down because of the box art, also of the decals that the model gives you. This model here, I procured off of eBay. I paid roughly about 20 to 30 US dollars for it, which is the going rate for these ones. These kits are still somewhat commonly available, although obviously as time goes on, the supply are gonna start drying up and these models are gonna eventually cross over into the realm of collectability, which will just bump up the prices on them. Fortunately, in today's market, if you're looking for an M60A1, there's actually quite a lot of options available to you. We have the versions from Tamiya, of course, Academy, but we also have some newcomers into the field like TACOM, where they have 100% new tooling kits, and the same is also true for AFV Club. So these kits here, although they still build well, in my opinion, they are still not going to be nearly as good as the new modern super kits that I just referenced. But that does not mean I don't have any interest in building one of these models and adding it to my collection. So starting with the graphic design, here we have the, what I like to call the champagne box arts. This was true on a few of the other Eshi kits, one of which I did a review on on this channel being both the M1 Abrams as well as also the LAV25. Both of them had a box art and graphic design similar to this one here. We have an illustration of the vehicle in question and the illustration is actually very, very good. It's a very handsome looking illustration. I liked the color that was used and basically this is more or less the type of build that I want to incorporate on this particular build. The markings are excellent. I really love this era of American vehicles where I have these really big and gaudy markings on the sides of the turret. It's just really, really iconic. And for the remainder of the graphics design, we have this large champagne type background. We have the vehicle's name right here in this very attractive looking like display. One thirty-fifth scale. And of course, right here in the upper corner, we have the Eshi logo. One other thing to mention is that Eshi is the Italian company that produced the kits. However, Ertl was who they partnered up with to do the distribution with specifically in the United States. I'm not quite sure if this was true overseas, but definitely in the US, Ertl was the one that was distributing the Eshi kits. They would eventually also change the box arts a few times, and I've seen a few of them where they changed this logo out to the AMT logo, which of course is known for their you know plastic car kits. This kit here does give you one set of markings for the US, no more, no less. And the remainder of the graphic design is as follows. Just like with the other Eshi kits I brought on the table, the side sections of the box are printed in this red color right here. On this side, we just have some basic corporate information telling you that the model's not a toy, choking hazard, all that good stuff. The Eshi logo right there. On the side tab over here, we have another illustration, thumbnail version of the vehicle in question. We have the Eshi typeface. And by the way, for anyone who's interested, this is kit number 5039. On the reverse side, we have here some more corporate info as well as a barcode. And of course the other tab is exactly the same. So that's it for the exterior appearance. Let's go ahead and crack this model open for the meat and potatoes. So opening this model up takes us to the instruction sheet, but I'll put a pin in that because we're gonna go over the plastic tooling. So this is 100% injection molded polystyrene. Everything on this model is polystyrene. There are no other amenities such as photo etch or turn aluminum print, none of that stuff. This is old school, baby. So this is what you're gonna be getting. This is what the absolute state of modeling was like back in the late 80s and the early 90s. Everything here is molded in this tan type plastic and this is basically the same type of plastic I saw on the LEV25 that I referenced earlier. This model here, of course, was bought secondhand, obviously, and everything is still sealed in its hermetically bags, and yep, yep, the thing definitely smells like a vintage plastic model kit, which is an odor that I personally have a really enjoyment for. Okay, so like I said before, there's a finite amount of these kits still left in a original configuration, so we're gonna go ahead and make that number less by one. Here we go, cracking open the bag. Oh yeah, it's, the room's filling up now with vintage kit smell. Love it. Okay, so, pouring out the contents of the first bag. Takes us to the lower hull. 
So one thing I do want to point out is that on some areas on this kit here, it's actually going to be superior to the Tamiya and the Academy counterpart. And it's basically, you know, it was like a one for one exchange ratio on who had the better detailing between the two kits. Starting with the lower hull, first and foremost, if you can't stand the motorization holes found on the Tamiya and the Academy, well, or specifically the older school academies, well, you're in luck. Eshi's going to be your boy because, as you can see, this model is dedicated to be static from the get-go. No motorization holes whatsoever are present on the hull. Another thing that's nice about the Eshi tooling compared to the Tamiya, and the Academy for that matter, is that the lower hull is all a single piece molding. Unlike the Tamiya kits where this would be a separate section that you would have to glue on and then you would have to deal with some sort of bodywork and seam removal. On the Eshi kit here, that's not the case. It's like the old school Tamiya M4883 for that matter. Single piece molding, excellent. The type of details found on the component over here are going to be considered vintage and softer compared to what we're used to on modern kits of today. However, for the era, this would have been more than suffice. Hopefully the details come into focus. As well as the little axis cap there on the bottom portion of the swing arm mounts. We do have weld beads integrally molded on for the bump stops as well as also the, the lift rings found on the lower hull. There is some slight cast texturing, by the way, that is present on the lower hull itself. Nothing that's overly textured, but you definitely do see the cast texturing that is present. The side section over here have a little bit of a rough wave to it, which again would be very appropriate for the real vehicle. The next runner takes us to the upper hull. And as you can see, the tooling on this is going to be excellent. Also, from when I was told that these masters here were actually all hand created by craftsmen. So this is quote unquote old school Italian craftsmanship at its finest. And um, yeah, I could definitely see that. I, you could see the cast section here found on the front section. We have some, some foundry marks, which is a nice little bit of detailing. The shape on the casted sections is blunt as it would be on the real vehicle. It's not really sharp as it would be seen on some of the older Tamiya kits. The grill work looks excellent. The little handles are integrally molded on. Very finely molded. The hatch is integrally molded on the Eshi kit in comparison to the Tamiya Academy one where it's a separate piece of tooling and the piece can actually make the function. On the Eshi kit here, that's not the case. The Eshi also has the periscopes molded solid. Again, different from the Tamiya ones, which these are just hollow boxes. Probably the best feature found on the Eshi Thule, and this is where my opinion, it really stands above the Tamiya version, are with the fender supports. Like I mentioned in the M68 2 video that I did a little while ago, that one, the fenders are integrally molded into the Tamiya tooling. And even though it simplifies the build, it lends for greater accuracy to have these as a separate component because these pieces are perforated and have their own details on them that you just can't get if it's integrally molded in as it is on the Tamiya one. On the Eshi kit here, just like with the Dragon and the more modern kits, out of the, the box from the get-go, these pieces are separate toolings, which definitely improves the accuracy on the build quite a bit. The tin work does have this interesting kink over here. This is something that uh, may be inaccurate for an M60, to my eyes specifically, usually when I see these, they tend to be just more smooth with the curvature, but what, regardless, this is what you have here on the Eshi counterpart. So on the remainder of the runner, we have the turret. The turret looks excellent. Fantastic casting texturing. And we even have the General Steel badge right there on the side of the turret. Excellent bit of detailing. Some more foundry marks. The geometry on the turret looks really, really good. And the cast texturing, again, is really impressive, specifically for the age of tooling. It came out very, very nice. The cast texturing is continued on the bottom pan that we have right here. Hopefully that comes out on camera. We do have a little bit of flash, but, you know, that's nothing in the great scheme of things. Really easily polished away. On the tart, we still have some more indication points for things like the grab handles, the jerry can, the gypsy rack, stuff like that. You can see the tarpaulin 
integrally molded on. This is just like the Tamiya one. There was really no one doing the mantlet without the tarpaulin, except for the original Tamiya kit from 1974. So this is one place where the two are very similar. And we can see the tarpaulin itself right here. Basically, it's a wash, in my opinion, with the Tamiya tooling. Same type of detailing, more or less. Same is also true for the mini cupola tarpaulin mount that we have here. You got the jerry cans, antenna base, and a few other odds and ends, such as the searchlight mount, the MG guard, the loader's hatch, as well as the commander's cupola hatch. Loader's hatch on this vehicle here doesn't appear to be optional with opening or closing. They just molded it flat like this, so it glues flat to the side of the vehicle. We'll see, maybe I'll be able to rig it so that the thing can be functional, but we'll see how that pans out as the video goes on. Here goes the Commander's Cupola. Again, very nice molding. And unlike the Tamiya one, we actually have the little grab handle points on the various locations. And again, the, the overall quality looks to be very, very good. Here go the Gypsy Rack mounts. Little flash on there, should clean up very, very well. Okay, going into the second bag, takes us to this runner over here, which is just some more equipment. So we have the rear deflector grill section. The detailing on it is very nicely done. We have here the swing arms. Decently rendered, basically on par with the other ones, more or less. The spring and the bump stops. We do have some sink marks on, on a couple of them, but, you know, that should polish away pretty easily with a little bit of putty. Turn rollers. Return rollers have no interior detailing whatsoever with the tire. The tire is only rendered on the outer portion, which is, I think, similar to what Tamiya did, if I'm not mistaken, on the older kit. Here goes the little guard, which is, the other one is missing, but I think it's loose in the bag. Yep, it's right here. I got it. So yeah, that's a nice little bit of detailing. This is again on par with the other two. Shock absorbers, lower hull lift rings. The tail lights are better than the Tamiya one. Absolutely, the Tamiya one, even when they revised the kit for the A3 and the US Marine Corps A1 release, they kept the tail light from 1974 where there's no surface detailing on them. It's just a little plastic disc. So this one here actually has the cat's eye detailing on it and it is better than the Tamiya one in that respect. Academy went ahead and, did, and adjusted this, but if you're depending on the Tamiya one, yeah, that, that's something that's gonna be uh, room for improvement. The bow headlights are a bit on the chunky end. We do have a little bit of flash, but that's really, you know, not a problem. But, you know, they should polish up pretty well and be able to do the job just fine. Here go the fender supports I was referring to before. As you can see, they are perforated and they do have some intricate detailing on them that is absent on the Tamiya kit for the reasons that I mentioned before. And again, for the longest period of time, if you were looking for a really accurate M60 kit, the Eshi one here is probably going to be the one recommended for you. Here we have the final drive. And, uh, oh, the gypsy rack. We got some, oh, the front toe shackles over here have that section drilled out. This is absent on the Tamiya one. Eventually, Academy would correct this, but this one here from the get-go, they had that. The heater exhaust manifold. This has to be drilled out, of course, because with the way it's molded. And here you got the gypsy rack. Looks to be on par with the Tamiya ones, to be fair. And this is, an again, another aspect where the Eshi kit was superior was with the bin lid. The storage bin have these little handles that you see right over here. And on the Tamiya kit, these are integrally molded in. On the Eshi kit here, they were separate bits of tooling, which, again, lends itself for better accuracy. Next runner takes us to the suspension. Here you get to see the road wheels. The road wheels, in my opinion, are okay. The Tamiya one and the later Academy ones admittedly have better detailing on them, but these ones here are more than suffice for the job at hand. Just like with the return rollers, though, the rubber tire detailing is only found on the, the outer surface and not on the interior. So this is something that's arguably a miss and is present on the other kits that I just referenced. 
Here goes the sprocket. The sprockets look really, really good. And in typical format, they are missing their mudslits. As I always mention in these pattern videos, there are mudslits found on these drums. But as I also often mention, this is an optional bit of detailing as some of them out there do not have the mudslits present. So if you want to push the model with its accuracy, you can add them. Or if you just want to, you know, skip that, if you don't have the tooling or the skill for that, you can just leave it stock and still be all right. On this side over here, we have the main 105, two-part assembly, quite customarily seen on these plastic model kits. This should build and polish up extremely well. We have here the air filtration box. The intakes are separate moldings, which is great. It leads for better accuracy. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe the intakes are also hollow moldings, which again, leads itself for nicer detailing. And carrying on takes us to the searchlight. And if you can't beat them, steal them, because that's exactly what Academy did here. And I've seen a lot of the Academy searchlights, and I gotta tell you, it's this searchlight. They they just straight up copied the searchlight. <laughs> they took the Academy took the best of both worlds. They took the best parts from the Tamiya and the best parts from the Eshi, and you know they were able to do what they did on their M60 A1 kits. But having said that, the piece looks good. It's nicely detailed. And also what's interesting is that they rendered a different version of the searchlight compared to the standard Xenon searchlight, which is found on the Tamiya tooling. This one here, it's slightly smaller in size, and I don't know the number offhand or off my memory. Pretty sure I'll figure it out and throw it in the in the in the lower portion of the screen just so you know <laughs> I appease the, uh, the the patent fanatics that are out there but yeah it's that version of the searchlight and it's a nice touch that actually gave you this one as opposed to just re-threading old ground with the standard searchlights found on the other kits. All right, so as you can see, I actually do really really like the Eshi kit. It has a lot of positive things going for it. And now we're gonna go to the part that prevented me from building one of these all of those decades earlier. And if anyone knows a thing or two about the Eshi models and knows a thing or two about my channel, you'll know exactly why. And that has to do with this runner right here. Yes, you see, Eshi gave us the lovely cancer known as individual Lincoln Link tracks. They were actually one of the first to do it. And after they have done it, we have been stuck with this garbage and this mistake literally ever since. This is the one thing that I can't stand about Eshi tanks, and it's the one reason why I've, you know, basically avoided them like the plague for several decades. These tracks are garbage. They really are. I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what snake oil you tell me to use to glue them together. These tracks are shit. They're shit. That, that's all there is to it. I can't stand them. Um, we've been, these tracks are not done to make the tank look more realistic? They don't, because these tracks, one, they don't assemble and look like live track once assembled, and two, they just don't look good when assembled. They, uh, people always screw up putting these, or making them around the sprocket, trying to time them, and then have them wrap around the front return roller. They just don't work. These tracks are pure garbage. There's always that one guy out there that claims that they like them. Cool. They, they, I, I literally know people who threw models in the garbage because of, of what they got when they built these tracks. These tracks are purely no No way around it. And these were, again, done as a corner cutting process. And they were done to save money for the company. With this type of tooling over here, you can make a ton of these with pennies on the dollar. You don't have to look at other materials like rubber, and you don't have to get other molds. You just make one of these runners, and you're all set. And because of that, these things here have been a mistake ever since. So, now that I went through my tirade, uh, I'm not even going to show these tracks up close because these things are just going to end up in my spare bin. They, just, they belong in the trash, but they're not. They're going to the spare bin. I don't want to create more landfill waste. And instead, I'm using the big brain approach, and I'm not going to utilize them for what I have here. What are these, you may ask? Well, simple. These are single-piece vinyl tracks that I procured off of eBay. These tracks here are from AFV Club, and I picked them up as, you know, separate sections and these are what I'm going to use instead of those cancerous tracks and these here are going to be able to finally make this model blossom into the excellent build that it deserves to be. So the AFE Club tracks are absolutely excellent. They have some beautiful or molded in details on them. I mean this is like state-of-the-art single-piece vinyl tooling right here so we have excellent track face details. You can see the chevrons up close. You can see the center guide horn as well as the end connectors 
All the detailing is appropriately there. And on the inside portion here, we have absolutely no pin marks, which by the way are present on the Eshi Dueling. Not so much on the AFV Club ones. These tracks are gorgeous. Also, one thing about the AFV Club tracks with this type of material is that they mimic live track. If anyone has seen live track before on one of these vehicles, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't know the difference between live track and dead track, I'm not gonna go over that in this video, but I recommend Googling it and brushing up on it. It's pretty fascinating stuff. So the AFV Club tracks are timed perfectly with the Eshi Sprocket, or at least that's the idea. <laughs> uh, hang on, let me check to be certain. And as you can see, they absolutely do, which is great. So these tracks here are going to be used without any sort of problems. By the way, in addition to this video over here, I'm actually going to make an accompanying video where I talk about painting and weathering these tracks, let alone fitting them onto the model. Usually I do this with workable track links. However, for this one here, since I don't really mention so much in these videos how I actually go through the painting and weathering process, I figured that would be an interesting video to make just so you know I could help people out there to uh, paint these tracks and weather them in a way that makes them look a little bit more realistic. Now, if you are building this model here and you do not have the luxury of getting single piece vinyls like I am doing on this build, there are lots of options available for a workable track link solution. For the longest period of time, we had the workable track links from AFE Club. Those tracks are awesome in their own right, and they make both patterns. They have the chevron pattern like this one here, and they also have the octagonal pattern, both of which are more than suitable for this particular vehicle. In addition to that, there are some metal workable track links out there from a multitude of different manufacturers. And a newcomer to the M60 workable track link game is TACOM. Their workable track links, I've seen some excellent reviews on them, and I've even seen how they go together, and I'm definitely interested in picking up a set and accompanying or utilizing them on a build down the road, but that's something for another video for another day. But I definitely wanted to mention those options out there because they're more than valid and all of those will greatly enhance not just the Eshi old school tooling model that I have here, but obviously they would be used also on the Italeri re-releases that have been on the market now for a number of decades. The very last thing in the box is a little bit of screen mesh that we have here for the Gypsy Rack. This is something like to me it wouldn't give you on their builds as well. Not really sure if I'm going to utilize this as generally when I do these builds I tend to swap these out for some photo etch mesh but we'll see how that pans out. And the last thing are the decal sheet and this was always something that has been hit and mostly miss on these Eshi models. Of all of the models I've built from all the manufacturers and also with the age of many of my builds it seems like the Eshi decals here more often than not are just not decals that age very well. They tend to brittle up the moment they hit the water and very rarely have they been able to be installed on one of my builds. At the moment, I think I'm batting one for five where I've only been able to utilize these markings on only one of my builds and I've done about you know half a dozen or so like I mentioned before. So eh, odds aren't that great. Sadly, I really, really like the markings on this one here. So you know, worst comes to worst, I'll probably try to use them on the model. If not, I'll have to replace them with some sort of a, you know, painted on solution. Also, the decal quality themselves, from what I've seen, aren't really the best, but, you know, we'll see how that works. Um, looking at the, the decals in the light here, it's kind of hard to get it on camera, but I'm not seeing any cracks or brittling or any type of exposure to moisture, so... I'll give it a shot, you know, we'll see how that works, but I'm really not exactly super stoked on these decals here, but again, I'll give it the old college try. Jumping forward a little bit takes us to the model at this point. Here we have the model going through its construction. At this point, the upper lower hull sections, turret sections, and the mini turret cupola have already been assembled. At this point here, it's best to get it on camera at this time, just so that you have a better idea on exactly how the fit and also some of the bodywork is conducted on one of these models. So starting with the hull, you'll notice that I went ahead and glued the hull together prior to the installation of the lower hull fittings as well as the suspension parts. I did go ahead and glue some of the lift rings originally. However, this was something if I was to do again, I would definitely do 
after this point here. The reason why I went ahead and assembled the hull at this point prior to the installation of the suspension is because, well, on this one here, you want to get the hull together because you do have some areas of bodywork to contend with. After the bodywork is concluded, it's you could then add on the remaining components, but it's best done without these fittings in place because it makes the bodywork job much easier. And this, by the way, is flying in the face of the instructions. I kind of want you to go about it in the reverse direction. Well, on the lower hull itself, just like what was seen on the Tamiya M48, which is pretty interesting, on the rear portion and the front portion here are these two slits that are integrally molded in. Undoubtedly, this is due to the mold making process. Well, these slits are present once you assemble the hull and need to go because obviously they're not there on the real vehicle. And again, this is best done before the suspension is fitted. So in order to plug up these two slits here, I utilize some sheet styrene, which you can maybe see it no, you're not going to be able to get in there. Anyway, there's some pieces of sheet styrene that were cut, slipped into these sections over here, and then were polished away and blended in with the bodywork. The upper and lower hulls were then glued together, and then there was another seam found in this section over here where the wall here of the upper makes contact with the lower hull, and again, the seam is actually fairly wide. It's about a 16 of an inch, if that, so a little bit of putty was added in place in order to flare everything in. Back to the sections on the front and the rear, with the red putty added I gently sanded everything down but I didn't sand them down completely flush because as I often mention in these videos and I also mentioned earlier in this particular video, the lower hulls on these patent based vehicles are all cast so texturing would be present. So when you're blending everything in you don't have to go super smooth with it, you can leave just a little bit of texturing remaining which will actually enhance the build as opposed to hurting it. Also on the front section over here, you'll see I went ahead and did a little bodywork in this section as well as on this section, flaring in the two seam lines as again, these would not be present on the real vehicle and the seam lines found on the model here were enough where, you know, a good bit of elbow grease would have been preferable. Other areas to mention in regards to bodywork on the hull are right here on the side bins. This is true for both sides. With the way the kit is molded on my example, I did have a slight sink mark found in these four locations. It was easily taken care of. Just a little smear of red putty, some wet sanding later, and everything is now totally smooth. And this takes us now to the fitting of the upper and lower hull sections. And the fit are pretty good. And... This brings us directly to the turret and the mini turret. We see, when I say pretty good, I'm specifically referring to pretty good in regards to the type of tooling that we have here. If we look at the turret, you'll see that a hell of a lot of rubber bands are used in order to get the pieces to align and jig together until the glue is set. And this is the type of tooling that you're going to expect this type of fitting on from this type of a model. And this leads me directly to what I heard a lot of people mentioning over the years on the fitting of the kit components in regards to the original Eshi versus the Italeri re-releases. Some people will tell you that the Italeri ones fit together much more problematically compared to the original Eshi ones because the molds have worn out over time. And honestly, I'm not really sure that holds a lot of water. In my opinion, I believe that the two fit together basically the same. Now, I have done an Italeri one before. I did it you know, years ago for a commission, and I'm not really seeing the difference between the two. Now, frankly, that was 10 years ago, and I didn't even use the turret. I believe I used a Resin aftermarket turret. So, at some point in time, I am going to get the Italeri one and, you know compare and contrast but for right now for what I'm seeing there's really no difference what I believe a lot of people are having this uh, this rumor or where it comes from is that a lot of people are used to building modern model kits like if you're used to building contemporary kits from Dragon, Ryfield, Tacom and so on and so forth and then you're going back to an older tooling kit like this here you are going to notice that the fit on the components do require more hand fitting. And this is just par for the course when you're working on an older kit. These older tooling kits over here, the masters on them are all handmade, specifically Eshi. They handcrafted all of the masters that are found on these models. And because of that, they're not going to have nearly as good of a fit compared to something that was done in, you know, with modern computer controlled die cutting technology. So, 
the parts will go together, but they will require a little bit of hand fitting here or there, possibly extra jigging and also some body work in order to fully get them to be properly fitted to one another and installed without any seam work. And that's what I'm seeing here. So as you can see with the turret, the upper and lower hull sections fit just fine, but you will see quite a lot of jigging going on just to make sure that everything is properly glued in place and nothing is sticking up where it shouldn't. So I'm gonna go ahead and take all these rubber bands off. And with the rubber bands removed, you'll see how the upper and lower hull sections went. As you can see there, even though the sections lined up appropriately, there is still a little bit of overhang in some areas and there is some seam work in others. And again, this is just, you know, normal for a build like this. This is something I am going to address, obviously, with the various bodywork solutions that I reference frequently in these videos, but a lot of people who are used to building modern kits are gonna see this and they're gonna turn their noses up and say, oh, well, uh, the fit's actually quite horrible, it doesn't fit right. Those people don't know what they're talking about. Um, or if they are, they're really spoiled from working on kits that have been tooled up in the last 20 something years, you know? Back in the, you know, the 70s, the 80s, and even into the early portion of the 90s, this is basically what almost all the kits were like from the various manufacturers. So we just, you know, grew up with this and and we're normal with this and also it taught us how to become better model builders because we have to learn you know sink or swim how to do things like body work and hand fitting so you know that is something again i do want to mention but overall these will polish away very very well and you'll see what it looks like after the model is completed uh as for the mini turret and cupola setup again same thing we have uh you know the seam lines up pretty well just a little bit of polishing is all that's going to be required in order to get this thing you know basically ready for prime time and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be hearing in the comments section about someone who has the Italian we're wondering they're going to claim that the fit was off on all these components. And I'm just going to rebuke that by saying, yeah, and I have to do basically the same thing to this original SU one over here. So the upper and lower hull sections, back to what I was alluding to before, they went together pretty well, but the rear section did require some extra jigging in order to make sure the rear plate and the top plate fit to, and puzzle piece together just right. There are some like puzzle fit type sections in this area over here, and also you will have an area where the rear plate makes contact with both these sections and there is a seam found in this section over here. Well, everything does fit in place. However, in order to get it to fit in place, you will have to properly jig everything. If you're just going willy nilly with the adhesives and gluing this thing together, you are gonna have seam work found in this rear section. On this one here, you'll notice that the seam work is just not there because I properly jigged everything. This was assembled, of course, using both thick super glue and then thin super glue in order to, you know, get everything in place. The thin super glue dries basically on contact, so you don't have to jig it for too long of a period of time. But once the super glue all set and after the jigs were removed, this is the final outcome. In order to jig this in place, I used tape here on the front. Nice little stretch here of masking tape just to bridge these two areas together. Then on the rear section over here, I actually used a clamp. This one to be specific. As a matter of fact, you can still see how it was lined up. So basically, I used one of these giant wood clamps over here to put pressure on the inner ring of the turret and the rear engine area and you can see how it just squeezes everything together once this is all squeezed in place with the right amount of glue everything was added to the appropriate locations one set presto you have an upper hull that is now together without any seams this is the type of tooling by the way that some other builders out there might have trouble with and specifically again if you're used to working with modern super kits you're gonna be like oh my god the fit is so wrong why is it it takes a little bit of finesse and a little bit of craftsmanship in order to get one of these older kits, uh, you know, built just right. So, with that in mind, again, I would love to get the Italian one at some point and, you know, do a video on one of those. But, as you can see right now, and from the other Italian M60 that I've done in the past, it seems like everything is lining up basically on par with one another. And just right after I filmed the last take, I noticed I went to put the turret on to the lower hull, and you'll see, uh-oh, it doesn't fit. The reason why it doesn't fit, there's a slight little bit of flash found on the, the turret locks right there and right there, and this is e easily removed with just a sharp little X-Acto blade. Just carve those bad boys away. 
And this is basically the hand fitting that I'm referring to. Just a little bit of snipping of some plastic shards here and there. And this thing should be able to fit as intended. Ta-da. So yeah, this is the type of hand fitting that I was referring to in the earlier scenes. And on a model like this, there's uh, not, not an overly, you know, uh, obscene amount of it, but again, a part here or there just require a little bit of hand fitting just to get everything to fit appropriately. And once you're used to it, a build like this, you know, basically goes together fairly easily. So as the model continues with its construction, here we have the turret more or less coming to its end point. So, the majority of the components you see here are all stocked with the kit at this time. I already touched upon the upper and lower sections of the turret and how they fit earlier. Now that it's glued in place, you can see that the red putty has been added in order to conceal the seam line and also it gives the extra added texturing that would be present on a turret casting like the one we have here. Some other areas I want to mention in terms of bodywork are on the sides of the turret and also on the top portion that we have on, on this area over here. The side areas actually have the divots in place for the flare cartridges which are in a little box that would be secured to this portion here of the turret on some later versions of the m60 and although those divots are present on this particular kit the actual boxes themselves are not for reasons that i you know can't explain but regardless those components are not supplied with the kit so body work is going to be needed to plug those areas up and i just blended everything in one advantage about the turret because it's casted you could leave the putty in a somewhat rough condition and actually blends in and enhances the turret because of course it would be true to form to the real one. This was done to both sides of the turret that you see here. Another location where you see that I added the little bit of putty was right here on the back. The kit does supply you with a guard that gets fastened to this section over here. However, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that guard is something that's present on later versions of the M60, and it's not present on this earlier version that I am rendering this model as. So because of that, that part's going to be omitted, and so the area here was plugged up with the putty. The next thing I do want to mention is the 105. Like I said before, this is a two-part assembly, and, you know, the two halves were glued together without any sort of problems. Of course, you want to use some clamps just to make sure the halves are lined up properly once the glue is setting. Once the glue fully sets, a thick bead of super glue is added to the two seam line locations, and then once set, I polish everything down with some needle files and some fine sandpaper, leaving for the result that you see here. You'll also notice that the whole unit is pre-primed prior to mounting onto the model, and this is another common technique that I utilize. By doing this, this is a great way to double check and verify if the tube is ready to go. The last thing you want to do is paint the model only to ha have surprises of seam sections popping out at you, or possibly some material that's not sanded down. Neither of which is any good, so it's best to pre-prime everything and then adjust accordingly. On the unit over here, I actually did a pretty good job the first time around, so it required absolutely no secondary tweaking whatsoever. Everything Once the paint was dry, I visually inspected it. It was then mounted to the mantlet like you see here without any sort of problems. The next thing I want to touch upon at this time, specifically before the model is fully completed, is the gypsy rack. The gypsy rack is what separates the men from the boys on just about every single M60 kit on the market, be it from Tamiya or Academy, and the Eshi kit here is absolutely no different. It seems pretty straightforward, and it does go together fairly easily, as it does on the Tamiya ones. However, the hardest part on the gypsy racks is always the mesh work. This is something that is so deceiving because it looks really easy, but it is probably the hardest part on any M60A1, and this kit here is absolutely no exception. So, when it comes to doing the gypsy rack, you have about four or five different ways to go about it, and basically all roads will lead to the same end result. You can build it onto the vehicle, and then add the mesh work afterwards. You can also build everything off the vehicle, add the mesh work, and then secure everything on in place. And by the way, both of these methods I've already utilized on several other builds in the past, so, you know, I know it can be done. But on this one here, I'm going about it a different way. This one, I'm actually going about it much along the same lines as I would on my 1-6 scale counterparts, where I'm building it in layers and just, you know, waiting for the glue set and then just going upward with all the rest of the construction. So at this point here, you can see I have the struts fitted in place, and then I went ahead and mounted on the bottom rail as well as the first side rail. At the, once that was all set, I went ahead and added the mesh work on this area over here. Now, the reason why there's so many different ways to do this is because the, the, the gypsy rack can shift on you, and 
it's there's really no correct way on doing it uh, and having it come out absolutely perfect so you always have to take your time with it regardless and i always found that when you assemble it all onto the model installing the meshwork is going to be problematic it gets in the way specifically when you have these struts like you have here if you assemble it off of the model, it could be done, but then alignment onto the model becomes a bit problematic, making sure everything lines up properly and, you know, some hand fitting is going to be required regardless. Either way, again, we'll get you to the same end result. It's just pick your poison type of a situation. So for this one, as you can see, like I said before, I'm doing it in layers. So I already have the mesh work mounted on in this location here. And so far, this has been fairly straightforward without these the other rails in place, I was able to position the meshwork in a much more easily done manner compared to the others. Also, one thing I want to mention is that these side rails are not glued onto the model at this point, and this was just so I could get the remaining of the parts assembled. Once all of the units are fitted in place, including the meshwork, then I could go ahead and tack these units in place with a drop of super glue, and then everything will be good to go. For the meshwork, I actually used a kit supplied mesh here for the bottom rail however i didn't use the photo watch one like i may have touched upon in the earlier scenes for the simple reason that i didn't have any left on hand i basically used it all up on my other m60 builds but i am going to be using some photo watch like you see here this is left over from the edward set or one of the edward sets that i have floating around or whatever's left of them and although this set is for the to me an, an academy pattern of the m60 a1 it looks like you'd be able to transition over onto the su one without any sort of major problems the Edward set is a very nice set. Unfortunately, it gives you a ton of extra stuff that's really not necessary. Like we have here an entire replacement engine grill amongst other accessories, but that's really a topic for another video for another day. Regardless, by some which way, I have a spare straight section over here. One thing I like about the Edward set is it has the cutouts in these two sections here, which would be present on the M60A1 meshwork. And trying to add these little cuts here on the flimsy little mesh that's supplied with the kit is almost impossible. So these are important because on the real one, I believe these are used to strap on some sort of equipment on the back. I'm a little hazy on that, but I believe that's what it's for. Regardless, it's on the Edward one. It's not found on the kit supplied counterpart. Something I also want to mention is cutting of the meshwork. This is something that's also very tricky and it's harder than it looks. The kit does supply you with a two scale drawing of both of the mesh sections. However, trying to cut them out has always been a task, even on the Tamiya ones as well. What I like to do is I like to line it up and then with a Sharpie, I go ahead and draw the section that needs to be carved out with a bright colored Sharpie, in this case red. And even with that, type of color, it's still really hard to see onto the actual meshwork. So you're gonna have to do some fudging and fiddling in order to get a cut. Plus cutting with a pair of scissors, this stuff is a bit um, uh, flexible as you can see and elastic. And so it, it tends to be a little bit harder to cut than one might imagine. Fortunately, I was able to pull it off and pull it off on the first attempt. In order to glue it in place, you have to line everything up perfectly. And what I did was on this one was I used the very thin super glue over here. And I basically just tacked it on from this corner and I moved my way all the way to the other end. The glue dries very, very quickly. However, you can't just do it all in one shot. And you literally have to add the glue, let it set, and then tug and add the glue and repeat accordingly until you're all the way at the end. This is the best way to ensure that there's no slack found on the meshwork and to make sure that everything is at the proper curvature. And this is something that can kill a novice or even an intermediate builder out there who's you know doing one of these for the first time. The meshwork is probably the sure way you can tell a beginner builder from an expert. And even some experts probably have some trouble with the gypsy rack. Like I said before, they are as they are actually very hard compared to how they look. For the application, I do not utilize the tip found on here, even though it is still fairly new and the tip is still nice and tight. But I always found it best to utilize the wire technique where you dip the the wire into the glue and then you have a small little drop on the end. You basically do the, nin the uh, ninja poison technique and you apply the glue at a little drop to the appropriate locations. Once the stuff sets, you can then you know tug and then repeat like I stated before. So. Before I go ahead and continue any further, I'm going to go ahead and bend the PE here to the appropriate shape. Of course, you want to make sure the orientation is exactly how you want it, with the cutouts being where they are. And then from there, I could start 
assembling the remaining rails and the photo watch accordingly. And you know, that should, so far I gotta say this technique is actually working out pretty well. And this is actually the first time I've incorporated this technique on a 135M60, which is funny because at this point I've done almost like a, like a dozen or so. So, uh, you know, uh, with practice definitely comes perfection. So let's see how that works as the build continues. As the build is heading towards paint, one thing that I noticed and I wanna definitely bring it up to anyone's attention at this time involves the sprockets because it's the type of thing that if you're not knowing, it's definitely gonna kick you in the knees and get you when you're down. So starting with the sprockets themselves, here you get to see one assembled unit and here you get to see the components. Right now, these are ready to get the little middle sections fitted in place. But of course, like I always mention in these M60 and patent videos, I went ahead and added the mud slits found to the outer portion here of the sprocket drum. As I routinely mentioned, these are mostly absent on many of the kits that are on the market, specifically the older ones. And this is something that greatly helps add to the accuracy of the model. And it's also at this time where I say, if you do not have the skill sets or the tools required to go ahead and do this procedure, it's not a mistake because there are several examples out there of vehicles of this type that do not have the mud slits found on this casting. This is one of those things where, you know, you could go either way, but me personally, I like to add the slits because while well, I have the skill sets to do it, and also it just, in my opinion, just enhances the model because it's just that much more extra flavor. But if you're watching this video and you do not want to tempt it, I recommend just leaving it stock and calling it a day. If you do want to go ahead and roll the dice and see what you can do, I actually go ahead and show a tutorial on how to do this modification, and it's found in the video link listed below. So with that out of the way, the next thing I want to talk about is with the sprocket alignment. And this is something that will definitely kick you in the balls when it comes time for assembly. So with the way the kit is designed, we have a key and groove type system found in the two sprocket sections. At the moment, again, I don't have the the aligner uh, plates in place, but regardless, when you lock the piece in, it's gonna find that happy sweet spot and it's gonna glue together. Unfortunately, when it does glue together, the teeth do not line up and you will have a vortex type effect like you see right here. And this is something that is very, 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 very bad for reasons that should be fairly obvious. Track and sprockets need to time and they need to time perfectly unless you're going to open up a whole heap of problems. This is going to be a problem on any track regardless of the medium, but this is specifically going to be a ball buster when it comes time for using the kit original link and length, which you shouldn't do anyway, but if you are going to use the kit eventual link and length, yeah, good luck with that because it is definitely not going to be doing you any favors and it's going to basically contribute to some of the uh, negativity that I've seen mentioned on the Italeri re-release. But again, this here's the original uh, Eshi one and the bug is still here. So fortunately, this is a very, very easy problem to solve. What you have to do, and this has to be done at this point of the build, is you need to delete the peg found in this sprocket over here. And I went ahead and took care of that off camera. Hopefully it gets into focus. And normally there's a bit of material found in this section over here, that's the peg that locks into that groove right over there. So you're just going to delete that. You could utilize a sharp exacto like this here. I went ahead and utilized my Dremel with a small micro router bit like this one right here, which by the way, the link for this vendor is found in the video description below. And this made very short work of removing the material. Another thing to mention about the sprocket alignment is with the two guides. And the tooth guides are, again, one of those little areas where you're going to need to do a little bit of hand fitting in order to get the pieces to fit appropriately. This one's already been taken care of. This one here is still stock. So hopefully it comes into focus, but you will see two injection pin marks here and here. And these actually protrude from the surface of the part. This is something that can easily be polished away. However, if you don't polish these areas down, these are gonna add to the thickness of the overall sprocket and this can also throw off the alignment. None of which is something that is really any good. Fortunately, it's really easy to polish away. You just use a needle file like this one over here or just some sandpaper or both in my case. And then after you know a few minutes or so of some sanding and polishing, the piece is ready to go. For the installation, they just slide directly into place. They may be a little bit on the stiffer end, but as you see, they just press on without any sort of problems. You wanna make sure that they are pressed on nice and evenly, which here they clearly are. At this point here, you're now ready to just 
top the two pieces together. Normally, this is where you would find a little magic keep and groove section, but for the reasons that I just mentioned, it's not going to be the case here. So, to align the parts appropriately, this is a trick that I've utilized on my 1-6 scale builds, specifically my armor techs for the same reason. And if you've seen those videos, you know what I'm talking about. And this is also best done with a set of single piece vinyl or workable track links. But if you are naive enough to continue to use the individual link link tracks for reasons that escape me, you can still theoretically do the same technique on the straightaway sections that are on the link link sections. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my single piece vinyl track over here. That's from an aftermarket source, like I touched upon before. And I'm gonna go ahead and add the glue to the sprocket. Once the glue has been applied, I go ahead, line up the two sprocket halves, make sure they are lining up evenly, and then at this point here, in order to line up the sprocket teeth, I'm going to go ahead and wrap the track around right over here. And the track is going to act as a jig, and it's going to twist and contort the two sprocket halves so that they line up absolutely perfectly. By pinching on the end right over here, this will give me the force required to align everything right, and once everything is properly aligned, you can see that the timing is absolutely perfect with the track and the sprocket. As I mentioned before, if you are using the Indie Lincoln Link track, again, first rule of Fight Club, don't, um, you basically just line it up similar, you just have to line up with your eye first, then on the straightaway section, you just put in the groove and you just roll it like this, and you will instantly be able to tell if everything is lining up appropriately. Also, at this point over here, I do want to mention that you can see that the timing and the width of the Eshi sprocket fit absolutely flawlessly with the track from AFV Club. So, if you're working on one of these Eshi or Italeri M68ones, uh, and you don't, and you want to look for an aftermarket track source, but you want to roll with single piece vinyl, I definitely recommend the single piece here from AFV Club. The tracks are exquisite. Too bad they don't sell them separately. It would be really cool if they did. With the sprockets out of the way, this tank here is ready for painting. So, a few things I want to touch upon since the previous scene is first with the final drives over here. The final drives on the Eshi kits are hollow, and when they're glued to the hull, you will have a cavity found in these two sections over here. In order to remedy this, I actually mix my two-part epoxy and I just filled the area in. If you are looking to do a similar procedure, I recommend utilizing Milliput or Abe's Epoxy Sculpt for the same type of procedure. You do not want to use the red putty that I use for my bodywork because that is a tooling-based type uh, material, and when you use a lot of volume of it on a plastic model, it will actually have a detrimental effect and start melting the plastic. Same is true, by the way, for Squadron Green Putty as well as also Model Master Red Putty, if that stuff is still even in stores. So avoid those if you're going to utilize them on mass like I use over here. Once the areas are filled in, however, the model will definitely look better in the long run. The next thing I want to mention is back on the turret. You will see that on this model here, I went ahead and added the tow cables, which doesn't seem like a big deal. But one thing I do want to mention is that on this particular kit here, the original one from Eshi, the kit does not supply you with the string in order to give you the tow cable. They give you the tow cable and connectors, but the string is not included, which is a baffling decision. Fortunately, and by the way, for an M60, you kind of need the tow cables on the side. It's basically mandatory equipment, or at least bare minimum have the clips in place, like I've touched upon a few other videos in the past. But they give you the tow connectors, but they don't give you the actual string. So luckily with, you know, my shop being what it is, if you build lots of 135s, you will tend to have quite a collection of the nylon string left over in your spares from you know various other builds that I didn't add the tow cables on. So fortunately, you know, I had the string on hand. I basically followed the kit's directions. The kit does have instructions on how to on what lengths to cut the string. And you basically follow that and then mount them to the appropriate locations. One thing that the kit is absent, this is you know again typical for vehicles of this era, it seems true for the Tamiya and the Academy, is the little clips that are found right here that secure the tow cable and prevent it from flopping around. There are a set pattern found here on the M60A1's lower portion of the turret, and I followed photographs of a real unit in order to get the details here. The straps themselves are made from just thin soda can aluminum that I cut with a scissor, carefully bent the shape, and glued them in place. 
you will also see that the tow cables have been fitted to the model prior to the thing heading off into paint. Now, for some people out there, that's, you know, normal. However, on my builds, things like Pioneer tools and tow cables are the types of equipment that I always add after the model is fully painted and weathered. It just makes painting and weathering a much more easily done affair compared to when it's on the model. But for this one here, and this was also true for the M68 2 Starship that I completed a little while ago, the reason why I added at this time is because on these type of vehicles, specifically when you have to scratch build little clips like this, it's best to add it onto the model and paint afterwards because trying to work around by scratch building all these clips, then adding the, you know, cable in place after it's painted is definitely a problem. This is something that generally leads to just the clips breaking off and makes a mess pretty quickly. So it's easier for this pattern of, or this type of a piece of equipment on a vehicle like this to add the cable and then carefully paint and weather accordingly. And this is something that's going to have to be done in with much care because when you're painting tools like this on a model it's gonna be painted and weathered you really have to keep on the ball with your technique as well as most importantly the paint consistency because it could go sideways very quickly I'll be circling back on that later on in the video when I talk about the paint and the weathering but regardless that is a preview of what to expect now I'm not sure if the Italery kits remedy this and they actually supply you with a little piece of string or if it's you know basically you're on your own when it comes for the tow cable equipment However, if I ever build one of the Italian ones, or when I ever get to one of the Italian ones, I'll definitely be able to mention that in that video. Starting with the model's running gear, all the running gear components that you see here, sans the tracks, are stock with the kit and went on without any sort of problems. The row wheels are definitely something that are one of the kit's higher points, and as you can see, are very nicely detailed and paint and weather very well. Moving to the sprocket, you can see how this also aged very well specifically again with the age of the tooling and with those mud slits fitted in place you can really again see just how much extra detailing they give the model and they just make it look so much more polished compared to just leaving them without. Of course the last thing to mention about the suspension are the tracks there's no way in hell I was utilizing the stock ones and here you get to see the aftermarket AFV club tracks fitted in place. The AFV club single piece tracks are simply put perfect. They are fantastic quality, both in terms of the type of detailing that you get, the way the tracks adhere to paint, and more importantly, or should say most importantly, how they mount onto the model. The length of links are pretty good, it's pretty average, but the way they time onto the sprocket is exquisite. There is absolutely no modifications need to be made whatsoever. You just simply paint and install the tracks as you would if the model frankly came with them. These tracks are, I, I cannot praise them enough. The tracks themselves, again, paint very, very well, and I painted them in my usual format. First, I just want to say you don't want to use rattle can or enamel paints on single piece vinyl tracks. So spray paints are a no, and enamel paints are also a no-go. Those can harm the finish of the rubber and something that you want to avoid. The tracks here are painted exclusively with acrylics. Tamiya flat black was airbrushed on. And then the brown, or I should say the rust color is also an exterior latex that was applied after everything was coated with the Tamiya flat black. As for the paintwork itself, it's done in my usual configuration. And for those who don't know, American tracks specifically of the post-war period are a mosaic of rubber and steel, and they are in the following format. There are lots of other builders out there that they tend to make this one mistake where they don't understand what the composition of the tracks are, they paint and weather it incorrectly, and it can actually harm the look of the model. So what I'm referring to is, for instance, the pad itself. The track pads are over-molded rubber onto a steel skeleton, and because of that, the entire face here is rubber. I have seen examples where they make the chevrons rubber and the inner portion steel, and that is just incorrect. Or I've even seen some builders do the opposite, neither of which is something you want to do. The parts that would be steel found on the outside, of course, would be the end connectors and also the center teeth. That's it. The rest of the link, as you can see, is rubber composition. On the interior portion is where things get interesting on 
these patent vehicles. You can see where the rubber would lie, which would be on these two pads right over here that run alongside of the tooth. And then we have the steel skittle structure that is exposed. And of course, that also be weathered the same way as I weathered the other parts that I mentioned before. For weathering and painting the tracks, you have lots of options available. If you want to make your tank look like it's newer or one that hasn't been in the field for very long, you can, of course, first paint the rubber the same way, but the end connectors, you can use a different color, something like a dark gray or like, uh, to me, a panzer gray might actually work or even NATO black is another way to render it. However, I always like to go with the rusty method. Just it gives more color pop to the model. And also it's not uncommon to see these vehicles in this type of configuration if you ever come across photographs or have seen them in real life. Of course, this does boil down to the personal taste of the builder. However, whichever method you choose, either of which would be beneficial compared to just painting everything with a single color of black or gray, as this will not really help you much. In fact, it will actually be a detriment to the model as opposed to a gain. From the track takes us to the front hull detailing, and again, everything here is stock out of the box, with the exception of the angles braces, as I mentioned before, those were plastruck and fitted in place. But once you add that little bit of detailing, you can really see just how much more complete the model looks as opposed to leaving them off. Also on this section, on the M16, the same is also true for the M1. The front fender tips are actually made out of an industrial rubber. And so on my builds, I like to paint them as such. It wouldn't be uncommon to have these overpainted with olive drab, much along the lines you see on the M113s. However, if you are going to go with that format, it's perfectly fine. But I strongly recommend weathering them with some black dry brushing just to make it look like that the paint is chipping off because it would do that in a very quick manner when that type of paint is found on these areas in real life. Me personally, I just like the contrast of having the black popping out, as generally as you see, I commonly utilize this technique on my builds. Of course, this brings us to the headlights themselves, stock out of the box, painted the usual configuration, where we have the white light and the blackout light, and this is something I always have to just double check when I'm building these things, even though I've built a lot of these M60s in the past, the light color is always something that I, I tend to forget. But luckily these days, it's really easy to find. Quick Google search, and you should be able to know in a matter of seconds. Also on the front area here, we have the fire extinguisher handle box. This is the kit original one. And the piece itself was just painted in red as they would commonly be seen on vehicles from this era. And it's a great way to add just a little bit extra color pop to the build. Specifically if you're going with, again, a 1970s era olive drab M60 or an M60A1. Also found in this location are the periscopes. As I mentioned before, these are actually absent on the Tamiya, or I should say they're just molded hollow on the Tamiya. But on the Etchy one over here, nope, they are rendered as proper periscopes, so I simply painted them as such. I utilize gloss black for my periscope prism. Some people like to use blue, other people like to use silver. Me personally, I like the, the gloss black look. It tends to look like the way I've seen these things in real life. Whichever you do, do not use silver. Silver is the worst color to paint periscopes. They just, it never looks good. But black or blue, eh, depends on your choice. Me, I like to roll with black. While on the topic of things that are made out of rubber, brings us to the breather valve right over here. As I mentioned before, the kit's unique in that it actually gives you the detailing for the breather itself as well as this other little bracket which is absent on the Tamiya. However, the kit doesn't go all the way. On the real M60, there would be this very distinctive rubber breather shoe that would be slipped over the pipe and that is absent on the Eshi kit. So on this one here, I fabricated. It was really, really easy to fabricate. I took some small heat shrink tubing and I basically took a brass rod that I had that was the same diameter as the kit original plastic piece here. And I was able to shrink it with the heat gun. And while the part, or I should say when the, the tube itself was still soft and pliable, I squished the ends here with a small flat plier. Once the rubber solidified, it gave me the shape that you see here, which is a perfect representation of the real unit. The best part is the heat shrink tubing that I have is this dull black color, so no painting was required. I simply just did the modification and then glued it into the location you see here, thus completing the look. While also on this area, you get to see the drilled out section of the generator exhaust again, always something that adds a bunch of detailing to the model, but should only be done, of course, if you have the bits and the pin vise to do so. If you don't, eh, maybe you might want to sit that one out. 
Jumping to the back takes us to all the details that we have here, all stock, they went on without any sort of problems. The one thing I do want to mention are the final drives. Like I mentioned before, these are hollow on the kit and you actually will see a hollow cavity if this is not addressed. As I referenced before, I plugged that up with some two-part epoxy and once everything is painted, it looks much better than having it left open. On the remainder of the detail parts, you know, again, out of the box, no problems at all. Here we have the tail lights. This one here, of course, has the red cat's eye painted red with the white light below painted in silver. While on the other side, it is a blackout light. And this one actually painted a little square silver as opposed to black, as I've seen, again, many real examples of these lights found in this configuration. Also in this area, you get to see the exhaust manifolds and one common mistake that a lot of people make on their patent builds. In fact, Mr. Chieftain even mentioned this in one of his videos in the past, and he's 100% correct, is a lot of people tend to over weather these areas over here where basically the entire grill is black and sooty and that's just not the case. With the way the M60 exhaust manifold is, we have two tailpipes emitting from the diesel engine and they are right here and right here. And when you see these things in real life, specifically if they're driven, the areas that get sooted up is basically a little circle found in this section and this section. This is quickly done with, with the airbrush, but if you are working on one of these models, make sure not to over weather it. You may get into the habit of just, you know, wanting to add a lot of soot in this bit area over here. The grills look like they would, they would really absorb it well, and they do, but it wouldn't be realistic. So if you're weathering an M60 or an M48, definitely keep that in mind. Moving topside takes to the travel lock. The travel lock is functional on the unit in that it can fold and be deployed. However, unlike the Tamiya one, the actual lock itself is molded static. If you are gonna build this model and render it in the stowed configuration, you are gonna have to make a modification where you're gonna have to cut this piece over here, mount it in permanently, or you can even mount it open if it's something that you deem fit. But regardless, this one here, it's built in, this, in the out-of-the-box configuration, and the out-of-the-box version does have a you know nice little animation like you see here. A little useless, but hey, you know, I'll take it. Mainly the engine deck is completely stock. However, now that it's fully painted and weathered, you can see just how nice those details that are integrally molded into this model pop out, specifically with the paint and the weathering. As I mentioned several times in this video, and will continue to do so, these kits really did age very, very well in this regard. Also found on the side sections, you get to see the bin handle lids, or I should say the bin lid handles, and they are, again, separate tooling parts that you have to carefully glue in place, but if you do and you and the planets line up and you don't lose one, you can see just how much detail fidelity they give the model compared to the Tamiya one, which had all these sections integrally molded on. Moving upward also brings us to the turret, and starting with the turret brings us to the tow cables. So the tow cables I did reference before, how the kit does not give you the actual string for the cable itself, but they do tell you what length to cut it. And here you have to see the piece now fully painted and weathered. And as I mentioned before, this was pre-installed before the model was painted. And to paint the unit, again, this was done after everything was painted and weathered, and it was done very carefully with a very precision and brand new paintbrush. Once everything was painted, it leaves for the results that you see here. And overall, I'm very pleased with the results. For the end connectors, I painted them with a slightly different color. I went with an olive green color on that. This is another way to give just a little extra color pop and flavor to the build. These components here were in a multitude of different colors in real life, so having one a different color from the tank is definitely something that would be more than appropriate. On the bottom portion of the cable, you get to see the little hookups that I mentioned before. These were fabricated out of thin strips of aluminum, bent the shape, and then once everything is Painted and weathered, you really get to see just how much fully fleshed out it looks compared to not having it. Continuing rearward takes to the jerry can, just like with the toe eye, this too is painted in a slightly different shade of olive drab. Again, just to give that much more extra color pop to the build. And you can also see the straps have been painted with the nylon green color, which would be to me an olive green. And if you've ever seen these straps in real life, this is exactly what they would look like. The buckle is painted with a little swipe of black paint as there's a little spring clip on these units that would be black in color on the actual counterparts. Of course, the sweat weathering was added to the jerry can itself, just to again, add a little bit more of extra detailing. And a similar weathering technique was done to the filler caps as I frequently reference on these builds. Continuing on the rear of the turret brings us to the rear gypsy rack, and as you can see, everything came out absolutely perfect. The meshwork is not clogged or 
chunked up with any sort of the paint, and neither is the photo etch. This is basically a nearly perfect execution of both of these medias. As I mentioned before, this is arguably the hardest part on the build, except for the tracks, which, but the tracks are impossible and always look like garbage, so I'm just gonna admit them all together. But the gypsy racks, no matter what the make of the kit is, these gypsy racks on the M60 are always the hardest thing to build, and this is definitely something you have to work your, you know, your magic on. Take your time and make sure your ducks are in a row and your gypsy racks should come out pretty well. On the roof, you got to see two of the antenna bases. We have the spring antenna, and we also have the other sort of antenna base. Both of these were painted with different colors of olive drab. Again, same reasons that I mentioned before for the jerry can and also the toe eye, and it always gives the model, again, just that much extra color pop. This one here actually would have a rubber section that emerges from the center, and then the antenna would plug to it, but in 135th scale, I'd just like to have the antenna rendered in the following format. On this one over here, you can see the antenna added as well. And this is just thin floor wire that was added in place. One common mistake that a lot of people out there, even myself, have made in the past is not knowing this is actually an antenna base and you just leave it without the rubber piece present. Now, this is not technically inaccurate because the, the, the rubber piece is removable, but more often than not, when you see these fit in place, the rubber section is present. Carrying on to the turret sides, you get to see the grab handles. Nothing really much to mention here. These are a surprisingly tricky piece to assemble on these M60A1s, just with the curvature of the turret and how everything needs to line up with each other. It's one of those things that actually it's a little bit trickier than you may imagine. But if you take your time and you install the parts appropriately with the right adhesives, you should be able to get the installation done without any sort of problems. Moving upward, takes it to the Commander's Cupola. Nothing much to go over here. Everything is stock out of the box and just everything just builds and paints so nicely on this kit. And once everything is painted, the detailing really does pop out very nicely. Same is also true for the Commander's Armament. The M85 here really does look great. And again, just simple dry brushing and the piece will look absolutely stellar. Moving forward brings us to the tarpaulin, and like with many things in this life, there are several different colors to render this unit, and this, again, generally boils down to your personal taste. I've seen these tarpaulins in olive green, and I've also seen them in the dull olive drab or green drab color that I rolled with on this build. The parts that would be green drab would be the parts that would be made out of the canvas cloth material and I carefully applied that with the paintbrush. Same is also true for the accordion section over here found on the main 105. As I mentioned earlier there is some hand fitting required to get this piece to fit in place but once all of the bodywork is out of the way it leaves for a nice seamless appearance like you see here. Last but certainly not least is the main 105. As I mentioned before, it's a two-piece assembly, so seam work is going to be required. But, as I may have mentioned before, the seam work is basically on par with all the other kits on the market, both past and present. Also, as I mentioned before, this shouldn't be a surprise with how smooth everything turned out because I again pre-primed everything after the seam work was completed just to verify and double-check that there are no hidden surprises. And now that the model is fully completed, obviously, it, it went out, or I should say the seam removal job went according to plan. And that wraps up the details. This brings us to the paint and the markings. So for the mouse paint work, like I mentioned before, I wanted to emulate as much as possible the example on the box art. And the way to do so was to utilize a different shade of olive drab compared to the other 1970s and 60s era American tanks that are found on this channel. Fortunately, there are lots of different shades of olive drab, even in the post-war years, so rolling with this shade here is definitely one that I've seen several pictures of. As for what this is, well, this is not exterior latex, which is going to make some people very happy out there. No, for this one here, I just went with standard, out-of-the-bottle Tamiya olive drab. The color was applied with the airbrush, and then from there I was able to add some washes and other weathering techniques to bring it up to the condition that you see here. The wash was added. It was just used as a sun fading type effect. It's very mild compared to some of my other builds. Again, I wanted to keep as much of the olive drab intact as possible. And the remainder of the airbrushing work was done with just counter shading. The counter shading again was done with Tamiya flat black. And then from there it got some of my dry brushing techniques that I generally mention in these videos. And that's what gives you the distressed look that you see here. On top of that, the other weathering techniques that were utilized was the Tamiya 
black panel line accent. This product is absolutely excellent. I've utilized it on lots of other builds in the past for good reasons. But for an M60 or a patent based vehicle, it's definitely recommended because of the grill work that we have here in the back that I referenced before. That stuff just loves to get in there and it just enhances and makes everything just pop out and it always looks great. The one aspect that I was actually a little cautious over were the markings. Like I mentioned before, in the past I've had some misses with the markings with these Eshi models. The tooling on the Eshi kits tend to age pretty well, but the water slide decals less so. So this not being my first Eshi, I was kind of apprehensive about using the markings, but again, I really, really, really wanted to give it a go because I just love the markings that are supplied with this tank. And there are no other replacement markings out there that mimic the ones that we have here. So I was gonna roll the dice with the markings. And fortunately, I had good luck with them. These are the original kit supply markings. They were able to survive the dunk into the water and even most importantly, they did not Thanos snap out of existence when I tried to move them, transition them from the paper to the model. Now that doesn't mean that markings went on smoothly. They went on as smooth as possible for an Eshi marking. I did have some minor complications of one of the decals ripping and tearing slightly in one location, but overall I was able to get the job done. And that little tear is not something that is even noticeable. If anything, it just blends in with the detailing and so much so that honestly, I couldn't even tell you which decal it was. That's how minuscule the damage was. But regardless, I got lucky on this one. If you are working on one of these vintage Eshies, bear in mind the decals may not necessarily survive the transition from the paper to the tank you have definitely been warned. Once the markings were adhered onto the model and were totally bone dry, the entire model was sealed with, you guessed it, none other than VMS matte varnish. That was applied with the airbrush and the look you see here is the final outcome of the varnish once it fully set. The VMS worked flawlessly or as flawlessly as you're gonna get on a water slide decal on one of these older Eshi models. There are no silvering, everything looks great. It just came out as good as it possibly can get for some of these markings. So the plants were definitely lined up when I went with the varnish coat and with the decals on this example over here. I could not, it was really a huge relief when I came down the next day after the varnish was dried, I looked at the end result and I was so very happy which really does go to show you just how excellent the VMS matte varnish is, where it's able to take decals of this quality and secure them in a manner that is in the end result that you see here. As I always mention, I cannot recommend that stuff enough. It is literally the best stuff I've used for decals bar none. At the end of the day, I am absolutely thrilled at how this one turned out. Like I mentioned before, I always want to add one or several of the Eshi family of M6Cs to my collection. And having done one now and built to the condition that we have here, it definitely feels so good. And it is indeed one scratched off of the proverbial to-do list. As I mentioned before, I always had an appreciation for the Eshi M60. I always wanted one, but I avoided them for the reasons that I've already mentioned. So being able to grab one of these, build it up, swap out the parts that need to be swapped out, and getting up to the condition that we have here, it definitely feels very, very, very rewarding. As I mentioned before, the Eshi kits in recent years basically kind of been forgotten about. Specifically, whenever anyone talks about 135th scale M60 kits that are on the market, generally the ones that get the limelight are the versions from Tamiya, as well as Academy, and recently with several of the newcomers that have entered into the field. But the Eshi M60A1 is definitely one not to discount, and it could easily be built up, built up nicely, and it could definitely hold its own, even compared to its contemporary counterpart. However, that comes with a massive asterisk that is attached to it, but you know, I've already talked about that in great depth and we'll probably circle back to that before this video ends. You could definitely believe that. And if I didn't know any better, I'd say we've accidentally trespassed into skill level and recommendation. As I mentioned before, I really do enjoy this kit and the detailing is really, really nice considering the age and the era that this kit was designed in. It does have some drawbacks. Specifically, if you are a beginner, I cannot recommend this kit to you. The model does have some finely molded detail fittings that need to be carefully removed off of the sprue, cleaned, and then properly fitted in place. And if you are a beginner, chances are really good you don't have these skill sets fully ironed out just yet. 
On top of that, many of the larger components, like I mentioned before, do require a little bit of hand fitting in order to get them to be assembled properly. And again, this is something that may dissuade some individuals out there, specifically, again, if you're used to working with some other either modern kits or even some of the other kits that are beginner friendly, they tend to have the fit of these kits go together much more easily compared to something like I ran to on this example here. Of course, this kit out of the box does have individual Lincoln Lane tracks, which are not recommended for anybody, let alone a beginner who I guarantee you are not going to enjoy assembling these tracks. They were crap, they're garbage. These tracks are garbage on any model kit, let alone the Eshi one. And I have assembled the Eshi individual Lincoln Lane tracks before on my Tonk build. So I'm not exactly talking out of thin air here. E even on that little simplistic build, the tracks were literally the hardest part on the entire model. Individual looking like tracks suck. I don't care what anyone says and that is something you definitely take to the bank. So I'm gonna well, I'll touch upon that a little bit later in the next scene or two But regardless this model here is definitely someone or I, I would say was I would recommend for someone who is an intermediate to an advanced range builder An intermediate builder could definitely tackle one of these models because you already have the experience under your belt with the things like I mentioned before working with fine detail parts as well as also working with some hand fitting, or at least you should at that point. Obviously, an experienced builder could easily tackle one of these models, but an experienced builder may find this kit here to be a bit simplistic, best way to put it, because generally those people are tend to look for models that are more uh, super detailed or more hyper detailed, and tend to gravitate more towards one of the more modern super kits that are on the market. This one here, this is arguably a good solid mid-tier kit where it does give you some nice detailing and arguably the detailing on this is better than the Tamiya for several of the reasons that I've mentioned in this video. But you compare this to say the example from TACOM, I would probably wager that the TACOM is a bit more advanced and specifically the one from AFE Club compared to this older generation kit here. But again, that doesn't take away exactly how good this kit is. It's just not as good as some of the other kits that again came out almost 25, 30 years after this one here made its debut. So, you know, that definitely speaks to the quality of kit that this really is. Because of the subject matter, there are lots of aftermarket detail accessories that are available to hop this model up, carrying it from the stock original kit offering. Obviously, the biggest one that I cannot recommend enough are the replacement of the tracks. Either go with a set of workables from AFV Club, which are pretty affordable, or find some other alternative compared to the stock individual link and length. That is really the I would argue the most mandatory modification to make to the build in order to just build it with the out of the box configuration. Stock tracks suck, as I again mentioned, and I will continue to harp that message. And the aftermarket tracks will only enhance the model by both giving it better detailing and most importantly, it will make it easier and faster to build compared to working with those abysmal things that are kit supplied. Aside from that, you have a plethora of other detail accessories that have been on the market for eons. Things like turned aluminum barrels, replacement photo etch sets, two cast resin, and probably these ace 3D printed components that can be added to enhance these models further compared to the stock original offering. Of course, if, is this worth it or not? Again, this boils down to the discretion of the builder. In my opinion, the rack with the photo watch is a good idea, but if I didn't have that spare PE on hand, I could have probably just kept the mesh work or replaced the mesh with some other PE mesh and that I just trimmed to shape. So that is something that would be a good addition. But again, the 100 time, I'm gonna say this, it's probably the last time I'm gonna say this in this video, but the tracks, you got to swap out the tracks. The kit tracks are crap. Swap out the tracks and the build is gonna be much nicer in return. Trust me. With all that being said, the one other positive attribute I want to mention about this kit is its subject matter. The M68-1 is a ubiquitous Cold War era vehicle, and this thing was not only produced in large numbers, but also had a really long service life, and on top of that, it was utilized by a ton of other operators. With all this in mind, this makes for a very rich subject matter, and with this starter kit here, you can build this thing in basically a multitude of different configurations. You can go conservative, like I did over here, building it with the out-of-the-box parts, making it, or rendering it, I should say, as a U.S. Army M68-1 from the 1970s time frame, or you could go with something a little bit more crazy, and remember, 
at the time of filming this video, there are still countries that utilize this vehicle to this day, and you can actually render it in one of those different configurations. So again, this opens up a lot of room for the builder. The real hurdle that this kit does have is its availability. These kits are not nearly as prolific compared to the Tamiya and Academy counterparts, and they basically curb stomp them in numbers that were produced. If you want any of the other two, you could throw a rock in any direction and possibly hit one. So this kit here is definitely one that's not nearly going to be as easily found, but they can be found from time to time. This is the type of thing you're going to find like on eBay or at a model show or at a swap meet, you know, that type of a atmosphere or environment. And because of that, the prices will fluctuate. Sometimes you get them for a really good price, we're lower than the Tamiya's, and sometimes I've seen them either the same, if not a little more. So again, just depends on whether or whether or not the vendor knows what he's got. Also, even though these kits here are no longer in production, specifically this version with this marking set, the tooling is something that does pop up from time to time and has been re-released on several occasions again by Italeri. The Italeri counterparts are much more prolific and can be found with much more ease compared to the OG Eshi kit that we have here. I wouldn't mind getting the Eshi, or I'm sorry, the Italeri re-release. As I mentioned several times in this video, would make for an interesting video and, you know, it's something that if slash when I do get to one, you'll definitely see a video of that posted on this channel. But, of course, that's something to come. Regardless, as I mentioned earlier, I specifically wanted this particular kit because of the markings that it gives you. I just wanted this example specifically in my collection. And this drags us into recommendations. So right off the bat, if you are an avid fan of the Patton, you are a Pattonaholic or a Patton fan, this kit here should be on your roster. If you have the Tamiya or the Academy in your collection, this kit here is definitely one to check out, be it either the original Eshi or the Italeri re-releases, which again are a little bit more commonly found. Needless to say, if you have in your collection the M47, the M48, the M46, the M60A1 here should be a complete no-brainer. And this one here, again, is a nice choice to add, even if you already have an example or two of the other kits I already mentioned. Along similar lines, if you're a fan of American armor, post-World War II armor, or Cold War era armor, this kit here, again, cannot be recommended enough. The final person I would recommend this kit to would be anyone who's an avid fan of building and collecting vintage model kits. The Eshi M60 kit family is a vintage kit, no bones about it. However, these kits really did age very, very well. And even though you can enjoy it as a collectible aspect, it still also holds its own just on the merits of the kit itself with the detailing that it does give you. Also, because this kit was re-released on several occasions and retooled on several occasions by not just Eshi, but also Italeri, this opens up quite a bit of fun in collecting where you can actually collect all of the different releases that were made of this model from the 1980s time frame all the way up until the present day. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale US M68-1 main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build as well as photographs of the other larger and smaller scale builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again, and I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.